Let's look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 to 28. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 to 28. I heard the news this week that there was a uh, gun shooting again uh, by a middle school student, I guess, or was in high school. People never expected him to be a gun shooter. Uh, he did it when he, it was his birthday. And um, maybe out of angry, out of, um, out of this, this uh, hatred against the world, he might did it. But we are facing the age of the age facing the crisis, and people don't really know what to do. And Matthew chapter 8, verse 23, 23 to 27. I will read first. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And can you read 24? And they went and walked him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And the man marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? Oh, just to 27. We're in the age with mental illnesses. We're in the age with addiction. At the same time, we're in the age churches are closing down. In this age, God is looking for Adam and Eve, and he's asking. Where are you? I'm um, in the age of mental illnesses, addiction, church closing down. May we have a time to examine who we are, where we are. And may we ask ourselves, where am I, where am I focusing on? And in this age, now that we are, we are responding to God, saying, God, I am really busy. I'm really busy working. I'm really busy checking, eating, working, playing, listening, watching. I'm really busy thinking, worrying. I'm really busy on Facebook, YouTube. I'm really busy checking my Instagram, watching Netflix. I am busy. When God's heart is on those who are perishing, that our hearts are on something else. Not only this, Genesis chapter 3, 11. Adam responded to God, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Where am I? We're at the position losing God. If you want to do something you want to do, you got to hide yourself from your parents. That's when children really do what they want to do, right? So we are hiding ourselves before God and we want to do what we want to do, we desire, what we desire to do. We want to watch YouTube as we hide ourselves before the presence of God. We want to eat something good while we hide ourselves before God. We want to buy some clothes while we're hiding ourselves before God, that we are losing God at the same time. And God was asking today to me, Johan, what are you doing? And I was answering him, God, I am busy preparing the message. I am busy meeting all these congregations that 
who, who you want me to meet. I am busy doing something. I am busy working on my homework. I am busy, you know, finishing my, finishing my, uh, finishing my grades, finishing my career. I am busy to do this. And I am so busy. I was captivated by, by my own works. And I am excusing God. God, I do all this for you. Though that was just my excuse. That I wasn't with him. That when he asked me, where are you, Johan? I was losing him. I was hiding myself, doing something, you know. And asking, telling him, God, please just um." Can I excuse for a second? You're with me 24-7. So can I excuse for a second? Can I hide myself? I want to do this. I want to do that. I need to earn this. That I am losing God. And I was losing God for a long time. That's what I was thinking. He was asking me, where are you, Johan? What are you doing? And, you know, excusing him. I'm, I'm preparing the message. But I haven't come to his presence. Not only this, verse 12, Genesis verse 12. Not only losing him, but also we're going against him. Who told you that you are naked? And Adam responded to him, the woman whom you gave me, gave to, to me to be with. And you have allowed me to go through this. This is why I am busy. That we are excusing God. God, you have allowed my children to be born. You have allowed my situation to be like this. You have allowed all this so that I am really busy that I cannot be with you. That's how we give all kinds of excuse. You got to be ready because a great storm is coming to you right now. When we're so busy, caught up with our own works, there is a great storm about to rise before you and it's about to swamp you. And that we are so afraid that we are lost, that we don't really know what to do. Where are you? And we may not look for him even before the great storm. Even all my possessions were about to be swamped by this great storm. We don't look for him. We don't call him out. You know why? Matthew chapter 8, verse 27. Let's look at this. And the man marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? Verse 24, we can clearly see the disciples are following Jesus, right? But verse 27, we can see the disciples don't really know whom they are following. This is what's happening to many Christians. They believe in God. They follow God. They call out his name without knowing who he is. When Jesus rebuked the winds and the sea, they were marveled. What kind of sorrow man are you that you can even rebuke the sea and rebuke the winds? People do not call upon his name because they don't simply know who God is. We've followed Jesus for more than 10 years. But the thing is this, do you know him? Do we believe in him? We are so afraid and Jesus is telling his disciple, oh little faith, why are you so afraid? It's because we don't really know who he is. A great storm, all my possessions were about to be swamped, that I don't really know what to do, I am lost. And now that we don't call him out because we don't know him. 
even though people are going through all kinds of mental problems, mental illnesses, they're going through all sorts of addictions. Even this week, I went to Alcohol Anonymous AA meeting. In 7 a.m. in the morning, there were already 18 and 20 people who were alcoholic. Before they going to their work, they were gathering there, and they want to be heard. So they were sharing their story. They were sharing their past, their problems. Yet there was no answer. Some says, I am really religious, but I don't really know what to do with my alcoholic problems. They were saying, I am alcohol addicted, but it's because my parents were already addicted to drugs when I was born, that I became this way. And that some might go to church, some might pray to God, but they are lost and that they don't really have the answer. You know why? It's because they do not know the gospel. They do not know Jesus. People are asking me sometimes, because I'm a pastor, they're asking me, Pastor, do you know many pastors committing suicide? Do you know many pastors treating their church as a business? Do you know many pastors are lying to each other and they're cheating on their wife? Do you know pastors are all going all kinds of problems? Do you know why, Pastor? Do you know how hypocrite the pastors are? And I simply tell them one answer. They might be that way because they do not know the gospel. Your position do not guarantee you having the right gospel. For 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 4. They say they believe in Jesus. They believe in another Jesus. Not the Jesus the Bible tells us, but Jesus, they want to imagine. And the Jesus they want to believe in, him, they depict themselves a great figure named Jesus, and they believe in their Jesus, not Jesus the Bible tells us. They believe in different spirit. They say, I've been guided by the Holy Spirit, and unfortunately, that turns out to be the different spirit they've been receiving the guidance. Uh, I remember I met this shaman when I was in Korea. She told me I built three churches prior to become a shaman today. And all my efforts building the churches couldn't stop me demon-possessed. That's why I became demon-possessed shaman that I'm about to do shamanism right now. She told me, I know everything you're about to tell me, but and I got to do this shamanism. She doesn't know. This is because she doesn't know, that's why she's become shaman. This shaman that I met, she was boasting, she was boasting about a woman sitting next to her, and she was telling me, this girl goes to the church, and this girl is a deacon at the church, and she's my disciple. And this shaman used to be in church for a long time, but when the demon came upon her, she can't stop the demon. They were running away to church. They were running away to pastors. They were running away, away to the mountains to pray. Yet, they couldn't stop the demon following me. What's happening is this. They simply do not know Jesus. They do not know who he is. Even this, this week, I met this guy. He asked me one question. Pastor, do you, have you ever heard about this pastor? And I told him, yes, I have. And he told me, how come this great renowned pastor, how can this pastor can commit adultery? What do you think about this? You know, he was simply testing me. He wanted to hear what I'm about to answer. And I simply told him one answer, and he has no choice except to nodding his head. I told him this. Maybe the pastor doesn't know the gospel. And when Satan's about to swamp all his thoughts and all his mind, he doesn't really know what to do but to commit adultery. People do not know the gospel. Many churches and many organizations talk about discipleship. They do not talk about gospel in discipleship because underlying 
They believe everyone knows the gospel. That they don't need the gospel anymore. But they need to put something into their actions. They need to know how to discern what is good, what is bad. Stealing money is bad. So that's what they're teaching. Be nice, be kind, be generous, just like Jesus. They talk about Jesus' characteristic. In underlying fact, they believe everyone knows the gospel. So in their discipleship, they tell them you got to read the Bible every day, maybe 30 pages every day, two chapters every day. You got to pray at least an hour, and you got to go out to share the gospel. But they do not talk about gospel. This is a problem. People believe because they go to church that they are elders or the pastors because they are deacons or they've been into church since they were born. They believe that people know the gospel. Yet, this Bible clearly tells us even the disciples were marveled at what Jesus was doing. They follow Jesus, but they do not know who he is. So there is a great storm. So all their lives are about to be swamped. And they're about to be lost, about to lose all they have. And they're so afraid because their life might be gone today. Might be gone today. They're scared and afraid. And they are living in that state of desolation because they do not know. People, not only that people believe in another Jesus' different spirit, but also the Bible tells us they believe in different gospel. They do love to believe in this different gospel. When Jesus says, being disciple of God, you got to stake your lives. And you'll be dead just like me on the cross. And they don't want to hear that. They want the gospel they can give them million dollars, billion dollars. They want to follow the gospel that can benefit their lives. Uh, most likely physically and worldly way. If my gospel can bring my son or my daughter being in Yale, I do love to accept that gospel in my heart. But if my gospel that I'm given would drop my son from high school, I can believe in the gospel. People do follow Another Jesus, different spirit, different gospel. And Corinthians, the Paul says, you are willing to accept that. That's the biggest problem. People are willing to hear, and they're pleased to hear another Jesus, different spirit, different gospel. Why does it happen? They do not know the gospel. They do not. Why do you think so many remnants and younger generations are vaping and they're addicted to drugs? They do not know the gospel. Why do people go to so many mental problems, mental illnesses that they can't even, I mean, they can't sustain their lives. But how come they cannot solve it? Because they do not know who Jesus is. They hear voices, they see something. How come they cannot stop? Because they do not know Jesus. There is a great storm, great winds about to swamp you. How come we are so afraid? It's because we do not know Jesus. I got an accident, car accident last Tuesday. My car was parked in fire lane. And this one girl hit my car. And she was telling me, well, your car was parked in fire lane, so that's illegal. So I don't want to pay you. That was what she was saying. Now, I was getting angry because I wanted to solve this problem by my own power. You know, she was like, oh, I'm like underage. You know, I got my license a month ago. And my parents are in Korea. My mom, my mom got cancer, so they went to Korea. And my my dad went to Korea to help my mom, so we are out of money. So can you please, can we have some better way to deal these problems? And I asked her, yeah, um, I'll just check my car at the body shop and get the estimate and give you 
give you the receipt so that you can pay me the way you want. And she's like, ah, oh, because I'm going through this, I'm going through that. So I shared the gospel. Instead of asking her paying money, she didn't care what I share. All she cared about was this. Is this guy going to say, give me money or not? So at the end, I didn't say I need money, right? And I told her, money is not my concern anymore. Because a word I meditate on told me to share the gospel with you. And she was really happy, not because I shared the gospel, but because I never asked her for money. And I shared the gospel. I even offered her, do you want to meet once a week? And she's like, ah, I'm really busy, right? I shared the gospel with her on Wednesday night. And she rejected all I offered her. But still, I followed the word of God. So I was kind of happy, but I was really stressed out. So I asked my wife to cook, cook food in the middle of the night so that I could release my stress. Thursday and Friday morning, I met her, right? I met her in the morning, very in the morning. Uh, not very. It was 8 a.m. And she was already up in the morning. I asked her, where are you going? Now that we're, we're having good relationship, right? And we're like, where are you going? And she's like, oh, I have a um, friend's party in San Francisco. And I'm like going over there with my friends and hanging around. And I was thinking, okay, you have no money to pay me, but you have much money to hang around with your friends. So I was getting angry again and again. <laughs> when you follow the word, that could happen, right? That could happen. But simply, people are facing the disaster and problem because they do not know. And I ask her one question. What did you pray to God when you hit my car? And she couldn't answer anything to my question. So I share, but I was rejected. <laughs> But I'm happy that I share what gospel is. Because she was a sincere Christian, and she was involved in this Christian ministry in college, which means she was very enthusiastic, enthusiastic with this gospel that she knows. But I'm not really, no, I don't really, I'm not really sure whether she correctly understands what the gospel is. That God has given us commission to share the correct gospel to many, that I'm willing to do that. Even there could be my loss. Even there could be, you know, my loss of all my possession. So my car is now um, not look so good. It looks bad. <laughs> it's damaged. But any, any, anyways, this is maybe our time and our turn to do this. If you look at verse 20, verse 24, in the problem, in your reality, Jesus is in a sleep. But now that disciple, dis disciples decide to do one thing, verse 25, they walk him up, save us, Lord, we are perishing. May you please wake him up. Never forget, when you're facing difficulties, Jesus in your boat too. It's not only the disciples are facing the great storm and great waves. It is Jesus also facing the great storm and great waves. It's not only the great storm about to swamp the disciples' possession in their lives. And this great storm is about to swamp Jesus' life too. There, Jesus was in the same situation where I am situated. That they cannot do anything, but Jesus has something to do with our own lives. It's not that Jesus is so away that he's just looking at our problem. He is facing my problem as I face my problems. He's facing my difficulties as I face my difficulties. He's confronting my situation as I confront him, as if it is his problem. He's facing it. He's confronting it. And wake him up. Let him not just sleep. Wake him up. He's in your boat with you. As a captain, as a savior, he's right there. And then we call Jesus as my king. I want to refer to three Bible verses. First is Hebrew chapter 2, 14. 
If we can, let's read Hebrews chapter 2, 14. Fourteen to fifteen. If we're on the same page, um, let me let's read together. That through death he destroyed the one who has a power of death, who is a devil, and to deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. He has set us free, the who were through the fear of death, became a subject of a lifelong slavery. Through death, he has defeated the one who has power over death. And that's the power of a king, power of Christ, who has done the work for us. Hebrew chapter 2, 14 to 15. Colossians chapter 2, 15. Colossians chapter 2, 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ Jesus. So Christ has overcome and he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ Jesus. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. The region the Son of God appeared on the earth. It's to destroy the work of the devil. When this Satan's trying to deceiving you, manipulating you, and telling you, and warning you, you're about to be done. This is what Christ says against Satan. Through death, he destroyed the one who has power of death. And through death, he has delivered us who were subject to the lifelong slavery. In Christ Jesus, he has disarmed the rulers and authorities, and he has destroyed the works of the devil. Jesus is a Christ. He is a king of our lives. He is a king of the oceans. He is a king of the great storm. He is a king of all the difficulties and problems. When he wakes up and he rebukes the oceans, they have no choice except to be calm. So there was a great calm after Jesus rebuked. Why? Because all the things of the world is subject that Jesus has made. He created all, so he has authority over all. He can't stop it. He can't start it. He has authority. So wake him up, who is a king of your life. He has overcome everything for you who were once subject to your lifelong slavery to your death. He has overcome. We believe Jesus is a Christ and that he is a true priest. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is what we heard and what we proclaim. God is light. In him, no darkness. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. 1 and 2. Therefore, now that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus, the love spirit of life has set us free in Jesus Christ, free from sin and death. Therefore, now there is no condemnation. Because Mark chapter 1045. He has given his life as a ransom for many. This is what I read when I was in AA meeting. This is what they confess as their faith. First, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had been unmanageable. They accept that. Second thing that they accept is this. Came to believe that, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. sanity. So a power greater than us can deliver us. And this is what they said. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to care of God as we understood Him. So how can they come to understand 
who he is, if they come to understand that Jesus is a Christ, I'm sure Christ has power over alcohol. Christ has power over any disease, any addiction that they're going through because he has died for us, for set us free from sin and death. That Christ is the answer of all. And as the true prophet, Colossians chapter 1, 13 to 14. This is what it said. The Bible states to us, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. So He has, the, he has power to deliver us from our powerlessness to His beloved Son, who has power over everything. And in Him, we have found our redemption and forgiveness of our sin. Everything is found in Christ Jesus. And Romans chapter 8, verse 28 to 29, uh, 30. Verse 28 to 30. And we know for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. And for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be confirmed to the image of His Son. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. Those who predestined, he called. Those he called, he, predest uh, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified them. That's who we are. In Christ Jesus, not only that we found, we find who he is, now that we come to know who we are, we are predestined for the image of God, for the glory of God. And in Him, we are justified, that we are clean, that we are washed away. That He is a prophet. John chapter 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to Father except through me. You will never be alone. You cannot never, you can never be alone. Because God is with you. Even in the boat about to be swamped by the great storm, do not forget Jesus is in the same boat with you. You're about to face your end. Jesus is facing your end too. And on the cross, Jesus confessed, it is finished. So Jesus is a Christ. The answer to all, God is with you, and God is with me. When you're in the, in the time of anger, depression, do not forget God is in the same boat. He's facing your depression, your anger, your difficulties, your financial problem. Then don't let him be in a sleep. Wake him up. Jesus, you are the Christ the Son of the living God. You are the Christ who is a king, destroy all the works of the devil. You disarm all the rulers and authorities. You have come to destroy all the work of the devil. We call upon your name that you are the answer of all. You are the true priest. In you, there's no condemnation. The law of spirit of life set us free from sin and death. You have delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the dominion of His beloved Son. In Him, we found our redemption, our forgiveness, that you are a true prophet. You are the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes a Father except through me. The important thing is, 
not for you to know how Jesus looked like. The important thing is for you to have the message of Jesus into your hearts. We do care about who's teaching me, but people don't really care about what has been taught to our lives. This is why many students getting F on their exam. They care about how their professor look like. Oh, my professor is white and tall and handsome. And this one professor with the fake glasses, a little short and Asian, can speak right English. And there could be this one, another teacher teaching us the subject, but he's not profession. Prof, pro, he's not really, he doesn't show proficiency in his teaching. So they all care about the appearance, but they don't care about what they're teaching. You will never have an exam asking you whether your professor wears fake glasses or not. What did he wear yesterday? How was he look like? Did he have girlfriend? What was girlfriend's name? My professor, New Testament professor, never asked me whether you know whether I have girlfriend or boyfriend. He doesn't care. We do care about the appearance of Jesus a lot, but we don't really know the message of Jesus many, many times. That's what we are missing. Many people react to the messages. They do react to the message, glorify Lord, hallelujah. And they're like moving their body and open their arms and shouting out the Lord, but they do not know Jesus. That's the biggest problem. In your boat, the Jesus is on your boat. He is a Christ, the answer to all. Maybe there's no reaction from you, but if you can take the message of the word, and if this message becomes your messages, then you will triumph over everything. One last thing. During today's message, <coughs> one of our remnants sat next to me, and we were listening to the message together, and he was playing around. He was on the cell phone. And he was listening to the message at the same time. You know, these days, the remnants are so great. They can do multiple things at the same time. You know, old people like us, it's because we're so old that we can process multiple things at a time. That's why we can only listen to the message, right? But when you look at the remnant, they do everything at the same time. And that's the difference between them and us, right? And these remnants were on everything, including Listen to the message, right? He was listening to the message. At the same time, there was one message picked on him. And he was saying, Pastor, that message is so great. And he was like, my mom should listen to that. And I just slapped his back. No. You listen to the message. You apply the message. But my mom, no, 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 don't even care about your mom. And the fact was, his mom was sitting in the front seat when he was in the back with me. Maybe his mom was listening to the message better than he's listening. But we do try to apply this message to many, but not to us. As a minister, as a pastor, one thing that I sometimes forget is, this God is with me. I do remind many around me, Yoko-san, God is with you. Hyana, God is with you. Diana, when you're going through something, God is with you. But when I'm depressed, I'm like super depressed. What am I doing, right? God, I'm left alone. I have nothing to do. Take my life away. I forget one thing. Is God with me? He's asking us, where are you? Where are you in the age of difficulties, mental illnesses, addiction, and church closing down? Where are you? God is with me. Can we repeat that all together? God is with me. Yeah, God is with me. Whenever my, I see my son and crying, I'm telling him, God is with you. And he's keep crying. He's keep crying. And that irritates me, right? And at the same time, I can hear he's saying, Dad, although I'm crying, irritating you, God is with you. God is with me. Never forget that. That's the greatest peace we can ever find. 
in the boat facing a gray storm. God is with me in my darkness, in my bottom. He is with me. Let's never forget that and confess God is with me. Let's pray. Um, can you guys play Turn Your Eyes? Um, just close your eyes. Um, and let's really think about the message we heard. Um, let it not be the message for someone else. Let's take it as our messages. Is God with me in my problems? God, you know I'm in the middle of midst of a great storm. I'm about to lose everything that I am given. But Father, please remind us that you are with me. The answer is with me. That Christ, the King, Prince, and Prophet is with me. Let's have a time of meditating on the Word and contemplating on the Word of God and contemplating on Jesus. Let's sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes.